Hello. Just loud enough. Whoever can hear me? Yeah, Chris, we're good. All right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. All right. Here we are, the August edition of the Drupal NYC meetup here at 30 Rock. Welcome, 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 welcome. Um, my name is Alex Ross. I will be your host this evening. Um, and uh, let's just do a couple quick housekeeping things for those who have not been here before. Uh, first of all, please unmute whatever devices you have that may make jingly noises and interrupt our, our fine speakers this evening. Uh, yes, unmute them so they will make as many jingly noises as possible. Um, no, please mute your, your devices. Uh, thank you. For, thank you. Thank you. Um, also, if you're going to be asking questions at any time, please use the mics. Somebody will be running around. Either Monty in the back will be running around, or I'll be running around with the mics. Um, this makes it a lot easier for everybody in the room to know what's going on. Also, um, when we record, we can get the questions, and then you know, people who are watching this video, you know, six months from now, wondering what the hell was that question, they'll be able to get that. Um, so please use the mics. And if you're the one up here and somebody asks a question without the mic, please repeat them. Um, so that it gets uh, 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 recorded and, and everybody knows it's up. Okay, restrooms. We have several of them. Uh, please feel free to make use of the restrooms. Uh, men's room, go out the stage right doorway. Go about three quarters of the way down on your left. Um, we have uh, 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 gender non-specific restrooms on this side, uh, halfway down on your right, and then all the way in the back, 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 back of the floor. And then we have uh, women's room, go out this doorway, stage left, and then halfway down on your right. Um, so please feel free to use the restrooms as needed. Um, also, there's uh, Wi-Fi and um, we <laughs> we have uh, Wi-Fi available. NBC Visitor. It's really annoying and horrible and terrible. You have to sign up like you're at a cheap hotel. I apologize for that, but that's what we got. Um, if you have questions, just flag me down later, and uh, and we can make sure you get on the Wi-Fi. But that's at the bottom of every slide. So if you forget what I'm saying, uh, it's there. Okay, um, I don't understand. I took this slide out. Moving on. My, oh, you know what, Monty? Monty, Monty, can you hit refresh on that keyboard? We're missing a slide, and we, we no, that's not how you do it. This is Windows, Windows. I know, I haven't used a Windows machine in a long time either. Um, what is it, F5? I, it's, sure. I'm going to go with that. But we're missing, we're missing slides, so he's got he's to hit refresh. Do I have to come back there, Bonnie? No, that's not it. There you go. Refresh. Yeah. And then present. Present. Excellent. And we're back. Almost. There we go. OK. Um, next slide. There we go. All right. So I, I, my apologies. We know, for those of you who are not here, if you're here, here for the first time, we normally feed you with pizza and, and, uh, and beverages. That is our typical um, uh, New York City Drupal uh, meetup experience. But we had a little snafu today, so there's no food. It's my fault. I'm going to pass the blame to someone else. But for now, we'll just say it's my fault. I do apologize. But if you come back next month, I promise there will be food. So please tell your friends and neighbors that there will be food at the next meetup. All right? I'm sorry. Please don't hurt me. I have children. OK. All right. Uh, agenda. Um, so we're doing announcements right now. Uh, we have three great talks today. They'll just start in a couple minutes. Um, some quick closing remarks before we go. And then we have an after party uh, sponsored by Fastly at Bill's Bar downstairs. Um, and I, I, I always point to, to Gergay because he's got the shirt on. But for a while, I thought he worked for Fastly because he always wore the shirt. And then I got really embarrassed when he walked up to me one day. He's like, no, I don't work for them. So stop giving me credit for the Anyway. OK. Uh, today's talks, here we go. Jeff, where's Jeff? Right over here. Jeff's going to be talking about Docker um, and Docker plus DDEV uh, as your local dev development environment. So we'll be hearing about that. Father Sean, who I have not seen yet. So he's on the way. So Father Sean will be here. He's going to be talking about uh, development, automa uh, development automation with Composer. Uh, and then we have John Pugh, who is probably, oh, there he is up front. Uh, and John is going to be talking about DevShop local tools. Um, and so we have a lot of, of very like DevOps heavy um, uh, talks today, which is really, really uh, uh, cool in my opinion. It's going to be some really interesting stuff. Um, figuring out how to get your, your code from here to there and, and making it work, and it'll be great. Okay. 
here we go. Uh, organizers. So there's a bunch of the organizers are in the room right now. Uh, we put this slide up to make sure that you know who the organizers are so that you can um, ask us questions, give us suggestions, um, you know, any of those good things. Please do come up to us. We really do take the feedback very seriously, and we try and make changes and cater the, the, um, the meetups and the other NYC events to the feedback that we're getting from people. So if you want to see something different or better or, or something, please do let us know. Um, okay. Uh, so the venue <laughs> um, was sponsored by NBC Universal. So thank you very much, NBC. Woo! Um, all right. Uh, after party, as I mentioned, is sp sponsored by Fastly. Yay! Yay! Okay. Um, uh, photos and hashtags. We encourage everybody to take photos, um, and uh, and we do record this uh, this meetup. So. Um, please, if you do take photos and you want to share them on the various social media platforms that are available, please use the hashtag DrupalNYC, or you can upload them at meetup.com slash DrupalNYC, um, and make all of your friends and neighbors and coworkers jealous that they were not here and you were. Okay. Upcoming events. There are several of them. Uh, Decoupled Drupal Days uh, is coming up in, in like two weeks, right? Yeah, something like that. Three weeks, two and a half weeks. Um, it's a really great event. It happens right here in New York City. Uh, that one's going to be at John Jay College this year, I believe, right? Someone keep me honest. Yes? Yes. I have a yes in the back. Um, so uh, I, I very much recommend that particular event. Um, they do a really good job putting together some really good talks about decoupled, the decoupled world and how Drupal fits into it and all the tools that you'll need on kind of both sides of the decoupling fence. Um, uh, Drupal GovCon in Washington coming up in three weeks, so get your Acela tickets now. Uh, and Drupal Corn Camp in Iowa, September 27th. Um, I assume one would probably fly to that one, so get your plane tickets. Uh, and then you can always go to uh, DrupalCal and get uh, um, more updates about other Drupal-y events that are going on. Um, you know, definitely, definitely find that out and go to those things. Go to there. Okay. Uh, interested in talking. We're always looking for people who are um, interested in giving talks right here at this meetup. We do talks that are of various lengths, sizes, and, and on various topics. You have like a quick five minute thing. Hey, I just discovered this awesome, you know, way of doing something and I want to share it with all of, uh, all of my friends and neighbors and coworkers. Tell us about it and, and maybe we do a lightning talk. If you have something that's a little more substantial, like a 10 minute, 15 minute talk, we do those too. If you have something that's like, hey, I want to take an hour and really get in depth on a particular topic, then absolutely let us know. So we have all sorts of different kind of formats, um, and we're happy to work with you on that. Uh, we would love to hear um, some really good uh, ideas for talks as well. Like, hey, I wish someone would talk about subject X, Y, or Z, and then we'll do our best to try and find someone who can give a talk um, on that topic. So please, please, please come to drupal.myc slash suggest and let us know if you have an idea, or you can just come up to any one of the um, organizers and, and we'll make sure that it get, all gets worked out. Good? Questions, comments, poems, nothing, okay. Um, who's hiring? Raise your hand if you work for someone who is hiring. Okay. We're hiring a, a Drupal 7, either front end or front end and back end, um, and some UN. It, it, and they can apply through Inspira or if they need to get, if they need to, if it's not up yet. All right, so the, the United Nations hiring Drupal 7, front end, back end. Talk to Stephen. Who else? So we work for the MT8, and we were hiring new Drupal 8 guys. Come, <coughs> uh, Drupal 8 and uh, uh, JavaScript. Okay, for the, for the MTA. Yes. Running our, our fine bus and subway system right here in New York City. Uh, no, 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 no comments for that? No, nothing? Okay. <laughs> hey, what's up? Thanks to Drupal. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, my startup dev shop support. We're always looking for super Drupal people, non-Drupal people, project managers, all sorts of stuff. I'll be talking later. John, dev shop, come find them. Kevin from Media Current. Uh, we're looking for Drupal developers as well as uh, digital strategists, specifically right now. A lot more on that side. So a little more non-Drupally, but Drupal adjacent. Drupal adjacent. I like it. All right, anyone else? Anyone else hiring? All right, so everybody in this room knows somebody who wants one of these jobs, so, right? Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing, okay. 
All right, here we go. Um, let's keep going. Okay, we're going to do, didn't you say, oh, right after. Right. Okay. Uh, so we're going to do a quick, actually, before we do introductions, we lost the slide, and I remember just now that we lost the slide. Um, the Drupal Association, right? We used to have a slide right before this slide. Oh, we have it? Good, okay. So we'll, no, 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 not about our nonprofit, about the Drupal Association in general. About the Drupal Association. We used to have a slide at every meetup to remind you to become a member of the Drupal Association. The Drupal Association helps the Drupal community, by and large, get, you know, make sure that Drupal.org is up and running and make sure that it has, you know, people who can work on it and update it and make cool new features. Um, they help with uh, various conferences and various events. Um, and I highly recommend that everybody become a member of the Drupal Association. It's DrupalAssociation.org. Um, and then uh, you can join as an individual member or you can join as a, um, as, a, as a business or a company or something like that. Um, but it's a really easy way of just, you know, throwing a few bucks down and helping the community as a whole, considering that this community as a whole is pretty much responsible for all of our paychecks right now to some degree or another. Or, or you probably wouldn't be here. So I really recommend that you become a member of the Drupal Association. Okay, now introductions. Um, please take five minutes, introduce yourself to somebody in the room who you don't know. Um, they should introduce themselves to you. I will wait till the most inopportune, poss you know, inopportune time possible to interrupt you and we'll carry on, but then you'll have someone to talk to when you go downstairs to Bill's Bar later afterwards. So go ahead and introduce, you some introduce yourself to someone that you don't know and I'll be back in a couple minutes. And stop! Okay. Ho hopefully that was, in fact, the most inopportune moment to stop. Um, but definitely continue, continue your conversations later and, uh, and get, to know, get to know other people uh, in, the, in the group. It's, that's part of why we're all here. Okay. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, ah, Drupal NYC, the nonprofit, the sequel. So for those of you who were here last time, uh, we introduced this idea. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole kind of shtick that goes along with this, um, but basically the Drupal Association has been helping to support us as a financial sponsor. Um, they're not going to be any longer going to be able to do that, and so we as a group, uh, or several members of this group, have gotten together and, um, and proposed that we create our own nonprofit, our own 501c3, in order to manage the finances of the group. We put on camps every year, we put on some, um, some events, and we have some money that has to float around to make that all happen we want to do it in the most above board, you know, transparent way that we can and make sure that everything is good. Um, so that's, that's the, the basic summary of what's going on. The information about the exact proposal and what it would mean to the community and who would be in charge of, you know, of what and, and how the money would get, um, uh, get managed and all that information uh, is up on groups.drupal.org. And um, we're still kind of in this period where we're asking the members of the community to make comments. If anybody has a concern, if anybody has an idea, if anybody has um, a question, please do go to groups.drupal.org um, slash Drupal, I think it's slash Drupal NYC, but it might be just slash NYC, I forget. Um, and, uh, uh, and just read through it. It's like a one page. It takes five minutes to read through what the actual proposal is. Um, and please do give us feedback. I know that over the course of the next several weeks, um, it's kind of been open for two of these um, uh, meetups. Uh, over the next several weeks, we're probably going to close the comments uh, at that point and decide that this is the way we're going to go or uh, incorporate the different feedback that we've gotten from, um, from different community members. But we did want to bring it up and we did want to make sure that, especially for those of you who were not here at the last meetup, that you knew this was going on and that you had an opportunity to you know, make your voice heard and, and, and bring up any concerns or, or helpful hints or, or whatever. Um, so please do check that out. If you can't remember to go to groups.drupal.org, then please do go to uh, Slack and you can ask in the um, Slack channel and somebody there will give you the precise link um, for where to get all that information. And again, questions about it, we'd love to hear that. Comments about it, we'd love to hear that. Great ideas on how we can do it better, faster, cheaper, we'd love to hear that too. So please uh, um, you know, make sure you do that within the next you know, couple weeks before we start closing up the, uh, the comments period. Um, okay, good. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Perfect. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. Our first talk. Jeff, where are you? You're right there. Come on up. Down. Up. This way. In this direction. There we go. All right, Jeff Markle is going to be talking about, uh, his, his talk is called Contain Yourself, Docker and GDev as a Local Development Environment. 
Normally I have speaker notes up here that I have to say, so I'm just going to say that Jeff has been working in this community for 133 years. Um, he's been a very, sorry, I need a, he's got a hyperdrive. You haven't seen these? These are great. So it's like a G Mac. It's got two USB ports, so you get power and connectivity for the main thing. And uh, we have the 6D input. Hold on, hold on. Wait. Is thing on? Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Okay, cool. So uh, I'm Jeff Montiel. I'm at Montiel on Facebook.org. Uh, I am a uh, manager and uh, technical architect for the Linux Foundation. We have a lot of great things going on at the moment with the development of our headless systems. We're in the back of uh, Mobile Labs. relatively new uh, environment for the web development. Um, and Silicate and Tozer and Docker and Ultra, I, you must have been under a rock if you don't haven't heard about Docker yet. Um, basically, it's a super lightweight kind of virtual machine environment um, that you spin up things really quickly save them and pass them around and you can create new containers and images. Um, and there are a bunch of new tools that uh, are based on Docker for web development, but one of them is Nougat, which we're going to talk about today. Um, there's also Lando, which uh, is sort of the uh, inherited or financial arm of uh, Calibox, the web engine Calibox. This was originally quite work out that way. There's Doxo, which is another one that's like FW. Um, another one that I haven't tried called Docker Playful, which is kind of makes all the documents. I don't actually really know about, but I've seen good reports about it. Um, and there's a set of them at Tozer, so if you build some stuff here, the network is okay. Docker-based local environment, which kind of builds the same niche as Nougat or Akub Web Desktop. Um, it is a bit simpler and less dependent on instructions running pretty much as soon as they run Mac on Windows or on Linux. Um, and so you can clean it in Windows 10 in all those environments. So the, the configuration is very easy to Includes as, as a part of it things like Ubuntu Admin and um, Mail Hopper and uh, what else? Google um, Web Building Support for Linux and Seven Languages and WordPress and Backdrop and Typos 3. It pretty much builds around the idea of supporting a lot of Linux development. Solar and Nginx environment variables for Linux. Um, we introduced a bug to Visual Effects and Visual Code, including Pantheon Auth, a pretty good integration with Pantheon. Um, and you could, in the near future, develop yourself an environment that does integration with Pantheon and Pantheon Auth on the uh, here in Linux um, and presumably Docker ports as well and maybe some other ports as well. Um, the one difference between NuGet and other systems like Linux and Windows is that um, very often Docker-based development would deploy in containers um, which are very adaptive. 
again, does Let me switch over to here. And this is a composer install of a basic um, Drupal, Drupal 8 system. Um, and I just have the composer command here. I'm going to run it. And hopefully it won't take too long. Um, if it takes too long, I have a pre built system I can demo with. Yeah, all right. Oh, right, I forgot because of the, uh, the, the, the security update. So maybe I should bag this and just switch to the pre-built one here. So this, this one I had already done the composer install in this directory. Um, and what I, in, in order to set it up for DDEV after installing the DDEV program, which is also available from Brew, you just type the command DDEV config. Is this big enough for you to see? No. Oh, Questions. One is the name of the, of the system. One is where the doc root is, and in this directory it's in web. It knows it's Drupal 8, so it, it prompts for, for which one, which kind of system it is, but in this case it knows it's Drupal 8 because of the contents of the, the file system. And that's it. And I can just do a dev start and it brings up a bunch of stuff it's basically created a docker a couple of docker containers and started them running um, so I can go to demo.ddev.local which is the system I just created And that's it. You know, that's it's like two minutes to bring up a new system. Um, now, if I go okay, so if there are any questions now, please. Yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. One second. How would you sync? Sync that brand new um, Docker contain uh, instance with uh, another, uh, like the production. So you mean like uh, the, the content? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll get to that in the in the next step. The question was how do how do I um, sync this with a production system? So let me go to the next one, which is this is an active 
actively developed system that I that I'm working on at work. Uh, let me switch back here. This one also. Uh, let me uh, again. I can't do the Git clone. It's going to probably take a while. So let me go to the pre-built one instead. But this is just would would do a Git clone of my repo for the for my project at work. See, there's some code here. Um, there's a web directory and a bunch of stuff for for my system. There's a there's a vendor directory. So, com, uh, doc, uh, excuse me, composer is already run. So again, I can do the same thing with um, a deep dev config. Let me make this bigger again. Fig. And whoops. I'm in the wrong directory, so doesn't like the name of the directory. That's what happens when you do live demos. Yeah, I moved the whole the whole folder instead of just the contents. Project name is CH demo, Docker is web, it's a Drupal 8 system, and configuration is complete. So I can do um, let me switch because there are a few extra things I want to do here. Uh, the first one is start. case because I haven't had a system by this name before it's got to add the uh, the, um, the name to Etsy posts so that's why it's asking for my password and to answer the question now about um, Syncing with a with a production system or a development system database, there there's a command called ddev uh, import db. So that's what I'll do right now. If 
file. It's here. So this is this is a backup that I made this afternoon using uh, backup and migrate module, and then I'll import these directly. The question was, um, where would you specify uh, environment variable values? So I'll, I'll show that in a second. So I've imported the database now, and what I can do is um, run drush commands as well. So I could do a dev exec drush cr to clear cache. It's basically running Drush inside the, the container, the, uh, the Drupal Docker container. This isn't very exciting to watch. So let me just quickly go to CH demo, which is what we called it. Login. So this, this is a project from, from work. Why did I change my password to this All right, so as you can see, it brought up a system that's it's all set up with, with content um, and configuration. So the, the, the last question was about setting up environment variables. In the configuration for, um, for DDEV, there is, I'll, I'll go into that directory. There's a couple of Docker Compose files, and in, in, by default, there's just one. But um, I can copy in Creative Docker Compose. Copying in a, a file called docker compose.env.yaml, and that has some settings. Oop, didn't clear the destination. And then I'll PI that. And this is this is how you would set up different environment variables in, in your configuration. And if I wanted to set this now, I could just run, um, I'll, I'll show you, I can do a dev 
to restart. If you're changing um, code, it'll it'll pick up your code changes without you having to do the restart, but because it's a configuration change, it's a YAML file that DDEV actually is using, it, it requires a restart. But restarts are really fast. Um, there isn't much to see that's changed. Um, so I, you know, I can go back to the website, but you, you won't really see any difference. But you can do things if, like if you have third-party integrations or secrets in that are that you want to set in the YAML file and not put into your regular code base, you can do it that way. I'm sorry? It supports multiple YAML files. In fact, um, another option is um, to add services like um, additional containers. For example, I have one for solar, so you can spin up another container that will run solar in it. Um, I don't know that I want to do that now. I don't, I, I don't want to take the time. Um, but that's really it. I mean, what this is, is great for is I frequently use it to do um, testing and reviews on pull requests. So you can just pull down the, the branch um, for the pull request, spin up a new container in a, about two minutes, and test it that way. And it, it really facilitates testing really well. Um, there are commands to turn xdebug on and off in the container, so you can do single stepping through and like PHP storm or whatever. Um, and again, I don't want to take up too much time with that since there are other people coming. But um, it's it's a really great tool for testing Drupal in um, and doing local development. And let me go back to here. And if there are here here are the resources, so you can various places to down download things. Um, the homebrew tool is a really important if you're running on a Mac. It, it lets you get all kinds of uh, tools, including Docker, Composer, um, and uh, any of these, Lando, Doxel, um, DDEV, Docker for Drupal, they're all available on homebrew. Um, and any other questions? Are you using NFS to the code base? Is that what is that what DDEV is using? No, it doesn't. It doesn't use NFS. It does a um, in, in Docker. You you can actually mount local file systems. You map a local file system directory to a mount point in your container. So that that's how it's done. Right. right. In this case, yeah, you just configure your system and you can forget about it. You, right. you know, you can change code in, in, in the host environment, which is your local machine, and it will be reflected inside the container. Anyone else? Yep. I'm back here. Okay. I have a question. <clears throat> I have a question over here in the back. Uh, are you prepared to answer questions about applications or potential applications for your system? Uh, not really. <laughs> uh, how about uh, the robustness of the language over time? I go back over 25 years ago. Oh, more than that. The now. robustness Compute. of? The uh, yeah, strength of a system, for example, historically speaking, going back to not really the beginnings of computing, but uh, Grace Hopper's version of the COBOL Codicil and Fortran. Those are uh, <clears throat> languages that developed many years ago, indeed, in the uh, military industrial complex. So they were designed for war systems, uh, private industry, insurance, disasters. I've had to look over the say, past 
last 30 years, or maybe a little bit more, of three particular uh, global disasters. I have background working over 25 years, FEMA, World Health Organization, Doctors Without Borders, uh, Scientists Without Borders, similar uh, organizations, specifically in the 1980s of the, the Union Carbide Bobol chemical explosion in Bhopal, India, and of course, most people perhaps have recognized the names Chernobyl and Fukushima as disasters. So when I'm approached about using a new computer language, I think back historically to the various versions of Fortran that were used in the uh, industrial setting, not the academic Watt 5, for example, as well as COBOL, as our old well, languages and any new language. I say, if I were to recommend or be doing consulting and advise someone to use a particular language or subset language, whether at the machine, a slumber level, or an upper, uh, higher level language, is it going to be strong enough and have sufficient uh, personal support and historic background documentation to have it be appropriate if I were to recommend it? And I, that may be a bit beyond what, as I said, you for applications. Well, well, it, just to think about. I'd like a yeah, response, I, though, just to Because this, this isn't a language. It is a tool to facilitate developing things in. So, you know, it, it's, and it, it's kind of a personal choice if you want to use this tool or not. But uh, uh, so far, it's very stable. I can tell you that. All right. Any other? We have one in the front. Thank you so much. Uh, it's more a, a, a less of a question, more remark, and I, I just don't don't want to be anonymous remark. I'm, I'm one of I'm one of Duxel developers actually. So um, remark. The, about the one of things you've highlighted, the mm -hmm. MySQL database uh, that survives the container deletion. It is, I uh, just wanted to remark that you might be missing some performance because of that. It's convenient. Oh, uh, understood, yes, yeah. and, and, and that is true. You, you do sure. lose yeah. some performance. I know Doxel had, um, has done some different things than some of the other systems have done in terms of um, file system access and which versions of Docker you use and how you connect up to the to the local file systems. It's as, as I recall, it's um, Doxel is quite a bit faster than, yeah, well, we than these are and try to squeeze out as much as possible out of the yeah, yeah your hardware. I just wanted it's a remark. I I mean. All others, many others do the same. They store database inside the container just because it's more performant this way. Right. It's not as convenient, so you're completely correct here. But just for those, like, you know, performance maniacs, they, they would probably oh, want to sure. store yeah. it inside. And, and very often when you're doing this kind of work, performance is a little less important. So, you know, if you're doing, if you want to do performance testing to see, you know, given the constraints of your system, then you might want to use something that is more performant. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I've used Doxel and I like it. I've used Lando and I like it, but I'm, I happen to be using DDEV right now and I like it a lot, so. It feels like a good place to stop. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Right, and our next uh, presenter, Father Sean, where'd you go? Oh, you're right in front, down, right down there. All right, Father Sean's gonna be talking about uh, development automation with Composer, uh, with Composer Robo and Docker. Um, uh, like I said, I don't have my notes today, but this building was built in 1931. Anyone who thinks it's true. Yeah. Oh, someone gave me, actually they gave me, they gave me trivia, one of the pages gave me trivia before. Um, so do you know who was the subject of the very, very first broadcast ever broadcast on NBC? Anyone know? It's on the Edison building downtown. It was not Albert Einstein, no. No, it's Felix the Cat. And they stuck him on, they stuck a picture of him on a record player and they had him just spin around so people would see him move. And that was it. That was the entire first broadcast that NBC ever did. That was interesting. Uh, TV, bro TV broadcast. Um, if you want it, if you want they had cat videos even back then. Well done. I teed that one right up, and there it goes. I don't know what he had. Can you hit the, the thing at the start? Oh, uh, nope. Close. No, that was the wrong thing at the start. 
No, the input. The input. The input. All right, here we go. Father Sean, ladies and gentlemen. that. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about development automation. Um, it's in, we're sort of Docker all night. Um, you know, we're talking about local development automation, uh, local development tools. Um, my, my presentation also centers around Docker, but also centers around some other technologies that we use at, uh, at Digital Pulp, where So um, this is me. Um, I'm Father Sean on Drupal.org, and I'm Father Sean on Twitter. Um, and you can find these slides on talks.fathershawn.org/automation um, afterwards. So you don't have to write, try to write any of this down. Um, and so there are a number of tasks that we need to do when we're uh, developing locally. Uh, we're working on on code. Uh, we need all the components of the things that work that run our um, our sites. So we need a database, we need a web server, um, we need PHP. Uh, in today's world, we also need dependency management. Your, pro your, pro your front end developers are probably using front end, front -end tools. Um, uh, things like Gulp and Gulp SAS and so forth, uh, uh, Uglify and all of that. So we need, um, uh, we need front end uh, tool dependency with NPM. Uh, you may also have JavaScript libraries that need to go to production. Uh, you don't necessarily want to want to send all of your node modules folder that you're using for your theme building um, up to production. Uh, I like to keep production as clean as possible because if there's some unknown dependency in one of those front end tool npm things, not so good. Um, you've got Drupal core, Drupal contributed modules, and now we're off the island. So you've got PHP uh, beyond. Uh, beyond Drupal. Then, as questions from the last presentation, uh, you also want to uh, sync with a remote server. You want to compile your theme. Um, you want to manage Drupal stuff from the command line using Drush, like we always have. So, this was the mandate um, for me at, uh, at Digital Pulp. I had some other mandates. So, I had some other mandates from my um, from my CTO um, at the time, uh, I did. I was at uh, FFW when Doxel's predecessor Druid was being piloted. Um, I worked with Linda on that, and then um, uh, we. So I had a few other mandates. Uh, DDEV wasn't out, um, but I'm very interested in finding out uh, more about it. Um, so we're using our own Docker Compose on this project, but I built it around Composer. For a lot, for a number of reasons. Um, one of those is uh, the things that Composer uh, does for us. Its core purpose is dependency management. Um, it's not, it, and it builds the auto loader. 
Um, ben Ramsey, one of the core contributors to PHP, sort of as uh, PHP starts its time hacks from the, 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 the booting up of Unix, um, uh, his time hack for modern PHP um, is uh, PHP Tech 2009 in the hallway track. Some people got together and started talking about auto-loading um, because there was this new thing in PHP 5.3 called namespaces. And with namespaces, we could have auto-loading. And all of that is what makes Composer possible. All of that is what makes it possible for you to put the right thing in Drupal 8 in the right folder and give it the right namespace, and it shows up. Um, so these are some of the strengths of Composer. Uh, documentation is online. Um, and the community has been moving more and more towards Composer. So the work that I did it was inspired by looking at the Drupal Composer project and realizing that they had, there's an event system. Um, uh, and, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's talk about managing dependencies. So one of the first, uh, uh, the first contributed Drupal module that I wrote that used objects was for a client that was using form assembly. So I have this form assembly module in Drupal 7. And I wanted, I've been porting it to Drupal 8. I really recently, uh, pushed out an alpha version. But for this module, form, form assembly API, I have to, the user has to authenticate to the remote uh, service via OAuth. In Drupal 7, I wrote a fairly simple uh, uh, implementation using Drupal HTTP request and the kind of, you know, exactly the format request and so on back and forth. Uh, but Drupal 8, why should I write any kind of OAuth integration other than just the bare minimum uh, that I need? So I wrote an extension for the League of Excellent Programmers OAuth library that has plugins like Drupal does, where I could just put in a few things that were plugins into their whole system and get token re renewal and uh, the management back and forth and all the methods and everything. So if you go to the form assembly module, you'll see that I have require Father Sean OAuth form assembly. It's a package on packages. It has nothing to do with Drupal, but it does the OAuth. And if you were to look in that package, is composer.json, you'd find this, which says, you can load this, but if you load this, you're going to need the league OAuth library. That's what dependency management is in a nutshell. It says, this, I need this thing. I'm not going to say anything else about what that thing might need. I'm going to say that I need this thing. And Composer parses all the composer.json files that are in the project, and it assembles a dependency tree, and it goes out, and it tries, it tries to resolve all those dependencies into a set where all the requirements are happy. But also, as I started to talk about before, it has this event system. So uh, all, I'm using all of this technology in a project that we recently open sourced that we call Ballast that we're using for our local development environment. Um, I'll talk more about the confluence of local development environments that's going on in Drupal at the moment uh, in a little bit. But it has these events. And the Drupal Composer project uses them to install scaffolding and uh, do a little bit of housekeeping uh, with the with the Drupal site, like move settings folders over and that sort of thing. And I noticed that. And uh, I would really like the Docker technology. I've got a team of developers at my company, and we were using Vagrant, and we're sp spending a lot of time getting this particular project running on this particular uh, 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 laptop or whatever. And I, my goal for this was to be able, for the user to be able, the developer to be able to run, Check out the repository and type composer install. And if they didn't have Docker, they would get Docker. And if they were missing another thing, they would get, another, they would get the thing that they were missing. And then composer would pull down the, all the dependencies in the repository and install Drupal and set up their site, set up their system. And I've got that for a clean Mac. Of course I hit dependency conflicts. If, you're, if you've got stuff installed on your, on your computer, and um, I, I, if you've already got something installed that, that was on my list, I assume you know what you're doing, and I, and I leave it. But of course, it might not be the right version. Uh, but on a clean computer, 
Composer install. All the Docker stuff gets installed. Um, everything gets installed, and it and it comes up. And it's all because of this event system. So, uh, in my in the composer.json in my project, at install, in addition to running the script handler that comes from Drupal Composer project, um, I also run a task to install to set up Drupal, and I run a task to scan for prerequisites. Um, and at the moment, this is only working on Macs. Um, I have an op I have open tickets for Linux and Windows. I'm perfectly happy um, to do that. I don't. I know that it won't be that much to do for Linux because most all Linux systems have package managers. It probably would have to vary by flavor um, of Linux. I'm not sure what to do about Windows because I don't work on Windows and I don't know if there's anything like brew or apt get um, for Windows. Uh, we may not, may not be able to automate make the prerequisites, but the rest of it should eventually work or something like it in some future confluence. So, if you're managing your site with Composer. Uh, rather than, you might remember uh, Drush DL, uh, you would download a module on the command line. Uh, this is the Composer equivalent. Composer required Drupal slash module name. Uh, and uh, today is update day um, uh, in, in Drupal. Um, let's go over and press play. Um, this was actually the 8.5 update yesterday, getting things ready. Um, and I'll just let that run play. There we go. I'll let that play while, run while I talk. Um, it takes about, I don't know, like 45 seconds uh, for, uh, this is the Drupal Camp NYC site, updating to Drupal 8.5 uh, yesterday. Uh, so when, when you're managing a site with Composer or when you're building a site and you're using things that are off the island, um, like uh, the the form assembly OAuth library, uh, it just becomes much nicer to manage all manage everything um, with with Composer. It's really easy to get the the Composer.json file unhappy if you're if you're just take, taking the tarball and starting to change things. Um, we did that for a little while before the Drupal Composer project um, came along, uh, but there's a Drupal. The Drupal Camp site yesterday being updated to 8.5 um, via Composer. Um, so, all the automation on this project um, is possible uh, courtesy of Robo. Um, Robo is a task runner written in PHP. Now, we were using Vagrant, and our task runner, runner was Ansible, which is an incredibly capable task runner. And as long as you everything you wanted to do was off the shelf, it was great. But Ansible is written in Python. And Python's an awesome language, and some of us um, uh, can hack with varying degrees on Python. But my whole development team is fluent. All my back-end developers are fluent in PHP. So if I build the, the automation in PHP, and a tech lead on a project needs to change a particular kind of automation, um, he or she knows how to do that, because it's written in PHP. Um, and so uh, these authors are the same authors. You may recognize these names. Um, uh, these are two of the three. Uh, members of the consolidation uh, sort of uh, team on, on GitHub. Um, Greg Anderson, one of the principal authors, authors of Drush. Um, uh, I'm, all, I'm sure there's Robo under Drush um, now. Um, and it, it's installed with Composer. And the documentation is at robo.li. So what are some of the kinds of things that we're doing with Robo? Well, uh, Robo, uh, in its basic form, when you have it installed, you can do Robo init. They'll create a class for you. It calls a Robo file that extends classes in Robo. And you, any method, any public method in that class then becomes a command that's executable on the command line. So uh, here's a simple method from, uh, from my setup. Uh, I've got Docker running it. I've got, it's running in Docker. Uh, we're we don't typically use PHP admin. We typically use um, SQL Pro or some other uh, desktop application. Uh, but you could uh, uh, use other things with this. We, so my developers want to know what's the IP and port and so forth. Wh what do I put in to SQL Pro in order to talk to the database? 
That's what this command does. Um, and it's run by just robo connect SQL um, in a basic setup where your robo file is in the same directory that you're operating in. Um, our, because uh, there's a lot of things that we're doing. We'll see later that we eventually broke our, I broke this setup into multiple, multiple classes because this became a god class because uh, it, it just, it's set up to have one class and a few commands. You have a lot of commands. Um, there's a more sophisticated pattern that I'll look at in a minute. Um, right here, as a matter of fact. So, robo commands can be split up into multiple classes with a front controller. So, ballastrunner.php is my is my front controller here, um, and I have my commands uh, set up into uh, class by you know, by task and good object oriented methodology. Um, so uh, here's an example of something we do, uh, of how I'm using it um, in, in Ballast. Um, Robo has file, file manipulating tasks already built into it. So uh, in, my, uh, in my, I have a template for Docker Compose.yaml because we want to use this on multiple projects. Um, but on each project we want, we want to inject into the site the, the short name of the site as part of its server name so that it can actually live on a real, uh, on a real URL. And, you know, we're, again, we're developers. We don't want to do the same thing over and over and over again, even if it's just cut and paste. So here, this little bit of code um, look, looks in a file, it looks for the placeholder, site short name with curly braces, and it substitutes in um, uh, the value of the variable that it's pulled out of config so that that gets set up properly. This is kind of some of the kind of automation that I'm talking about. Uh, we, al we also need to manage deployment. Um, so uh, when you're building a site with Composer, you're not committing any, any of the dependencies to your repository is the, is the typical best practice. So the, the Drupal, the contrib modules, they're not in there. Core, it's not in there. Um, let alone all of the, the you know, your, your JavaScript library dependencies and so on and so forth. But when you get to servers, you want a known state. You don't, wanna, you don't want to build this on dev and then build it on stage and it pulled in a different set of dependencies. So the build, building sites with composers also pushes us towards um, CI, CD. Um, uh, we use CodeShip, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But so you need to somehow build this on uh, on production, or build this before you deploy it to production. Again, that that happens over and over and over again. It should be repeatable and testable. So this is the this is one of the sort of uh, traffic cop methods um, in my setup, where these are the tasks that have to happen, and all of the building of the of the app to ship it uh, to the dev server um, is managed in automation. So as I say, we use CodeShip, and we were using CodeShip before, and I wasn't wedded to it when I, when I started into this automation. What I wanted to do, though, was if I'm going to run local development in Docker containers, I wanted to use either the same containers or essentially the same containers uh, in my integration environment that I'm using locally uh, so that everything's the same. Um, and, that's, and so I looked at Bitbucket pipelines, I looked at um, Acquia pipelines, looked at a variety of things, and CodeShip gave me the most control at that time, like eight or nine months ago. Uh, this all moved so fast. Maybe somebody could be better now, but this is working, so this is good. Um, uh, and these are the two configuration files that are in the setup. Um, the, the one on the left is essentially uh, a, a Docker Compose file. Um, it's using Docker Compose syntax. It's got a different name, but that's what it's doing. It's setting up the containers. And then another YAML file defines the deployment steps and the commands that need to be run. And so um, when this pushes, uh, you see the first line of pull dependencies, um, tag develop 
that's a branch name, so this only runs um, on pushes to the repository on that branch. And uh, you know, if we end up with more time, I can show you some logs of how that job runs. But you know. great. Well, I'm going to go through this at 10,000 feet, and then I'm going to come back and revisit any of the topics. Um, uh, I have I have code ship lo loaded up. I've got my PHP storm loaded up, and we'll go into the detail. Yeah. Hold on, you have to get, you, have, you can't talk without a mic, Eric. I'll repeat the question. Go ahead, I'll repeat the question. We can. That I don't know about. But I'm, somebody I'm sure has a magic button for the shades. Sixty-eight. I turned it up a couple degrees. Several degrees. Okay. Code ship probably could do that. So then we're so then we're on to Docker. Um, so we were using Vagrant before. Um, Vagrant is also a virtualization technology, but it virtualizes an entire machine. Um, Docker, the best way uh, I think to understand it is, it doesn't virtualize an entire machine. It virtualizes a process or a discrete collection of processes. So when you if you SSH into it, you feel like you're in Linux, but you don't have everything. Um, you, you just have enough to make the thing that you're using usable. Uh, so by convention, like object-oriented programming, um, the convention is to have one purpose per, per container. Um, and then also, although it's possible to shell into the container, now you're actually actually in the container to do more things. Um, so, you, so the best practice is is to inject the command that you want to run to send it to the container, to not go onto the command line um, in the container. Although, uh, we, I do that sometimes in order to debug, but not in normal life. So, uh, here's a snippet from a Docker Compose template. Uh, before, remember when I said there was a, there was a slug, slight, slight short name in the template? Um, oh, we have, um, so this template gets processed and put in place as part of our startup script. And uh, we set the server name. And we set the, um, uh, the virtual host. And if you were cloning this project and you didn't want to run your stuff out of var www doc root, you could change that. And it would look for it in a different directory. Um, and all of the containers, so there's a web container. Um, there's a PHP container. Um, there's a database container. Um, I have a CLI container uh, because it's almost kind of for historic reasons at this point. Um, now everything, Drush joined Drupal console and is in being installed on a per project basis. Um, but when I first started building this, um, Drush was typically a global install. So I had a CLI container with a few optimizations um, for CLI and I also had Drush installed in it. Not so necessary anymore. Might be able to simplify it. Um, I also, on this project, I have multi, what I call multi-project services. So you can, if you're developing on a Mac, you can, and you know how, you can edit your slash, uh, I don't know how everybody else does it, around my office people say Etsy, but etc slash hosts directory, and you could add an entry for a particular uh, domain, and then you could go to your browser and you could type whatever it was you put in there and you could go to that IP. Um, but if the IP change, you have to go change. You have to go change hosts, um, and you have to do it every single project. And again, I want people to just be able to just compose or install, and it works. So, in my Docker setup, the Docker Compose spins up these multiple containers that every project that gets started up. But running all the time in the Docker environment is a container that's an nginx proxy, and another container that's a, that's a DNS service, and all of my projects run on the .dpulp false domain, and uh, and they register themselves with this nginx proxy that Jay Wilder wrote. It's incredibly cool, and the result is that they can spin up a project, and you can go type the domain name into the into the address bar, and your Mac the Mac queries the, the DNS service, which gives it the IP address of the Docker machine. And it passes it over, and, it, and then the Nginx proxy does all of its magic, and you get your site. 
So I don't want to edit. I, I know how to obviously know how to edit my Etsy host file, but I don't want to do that all the time. I want it to just work. Automation makes that possible. And the final piece is Ahoy, which um, who knows Frank Carey? Anybody still know Frank Carey? Frank was in this. Uh, so Frank wrote Ahoy. It's written in Go. Uh, it does one thing. It does one thing really well. It's an abstraction layer for developer experience that allows you to put little tiny shell and command snippets in a YAML file, um, and then and define a, a shortcut for that, a command, if you will, and then you don't have to type the long thing. That's particularly helpful for Docker, and it works everywhere below. Like if you have an Ahoy.yaml file at the root of the project, every directory in that project, it'll go up and find it, and it'll run the command. That's particularly helpful for, um, remember I said that the command needs to go into the container? So here the top one in the, this little snippet is, is Drush, and uh, the full command is docker compose dollar sign docker machine config dp docker exec cli drush and then what you want to run developers are programmers are all lazy we're all lazy what well, i mean at a minimum you would you would probably if you knew how to make a bash shortcut or or you'd have a text file where you were cutting and pasting or something but ahoy lets my developers just type ahoy drush in the command and they don't even I mean, if they go look at the ahoy.yaml file, they can see what it does, but they don't even need to know that. Um, uh, when in, in my setup, the first time you boot up your computer, you have to start up the Docker infrastructure. Um, that, that takes running a couple of robo commands, and because the robo commands are behind a front controller, and I don't want to clutter up the root directory of my projects any more than I have to, they're in a, a directory. So to get robo to run, that's PHP scripts robo ballast runner dot PHP, and then what you want to do. So rather, so I can make two commands run with an Ahoy command. Ahoy cast off runs uh, robo boot and, ro and robo boot DNS, and it starts everything up. Yeah, yeah. Jeff. Yes. So um, part of why startup, uh, so the question was, how, how, how does the Mac know about where to find things in the DNS system? Um, and part of the, what's happening with the, the reason there's a command to start everything up, one of the things that happens in the boot process that a white cast off starts is uh, the Docker machine starts up. And then Robo says to the Docker machine, what's your IP address? And then that process that I showed where I could replace a slug in a file, there's a, in your Mac, there's a folder in, et, in the etc. directory or Etsy directory for, called Resolver. And you can put a file there with a top level domain name and put resolution credentials in it, and your Mac will, will look there. So I put a folder called dpulp in the Resolver file that has the right syntax to say, Depulp lives at this IP address. And I do that every time, every time you do a Hoyt cast off. And that's how it knows. Um, and because the doc, the, the, we're, we're using Docker machine rather than Docker um, for Mac, uh, the question of earlier about NFS. Um, so Docker for Mac uses um, something called o OX, OSXFX. Um, they have their, they have their, like, they have this file system mounting thing that they have going on. Um, there's a link in my references. The issue's been open for a couple of years about performance. Um, I hear it's gotten a little better. Um, there are some fairly complicated workarounds that people have come up with using Unison to like do a syncing thing uh, going on in the background and so forth. Um, I'm just using NFS. Um, uh, NFS on the Mac uh, is being used to mount the code base in the right place. Um, uh, Docker Compose does let you say, mount this directory from the host into this spot. Um, the, but then the question is, well, how am I mounting it? There are, there, there, 
Docker allows you to use rsync and, and NFS and a variety of technologies. Um, I'm using NFS for performance. Um, Docker for Max got some cool stuff, and eventually it'll probably be fast enough. Um, but I don't think it is right now. Um, so I used all of these technologies to build our local development environment, which we call Ballast because it keeps us steady. Um, and uh, because it's built in Composer, um, you can use it if you want. Um, uh, you can just do Composer create project, project name, and your project. And it'll clone into your directory. It'll run all, run all the infrastructure stuff, spin up Docker, um, do all that stuff, and you'll have a Drupal installation. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you like using um, WAMP or MAMP or whatever. Um, can't give enough credit to the Drupal Composer project. Um, if you're going to use Composer to manage your Drupal site, uh, there's an open issue on Drupal.org right now to make this clearer and to put better, um, and better support in core. There was actually really bad information out there at one point about doing it differently. Um, that's what launched this project. I don't think there's any other way to manage a Drupal site with Composer other than using this community developed, non official yet method. Um, and you can do the same thing. You can create a Drupal project, Composer, create project, Drupal Composer, and so forth. Um, and it'll, it'll do all the things, and you'll have the latest Drupal 8 installation. So uh, I've been going like about a half an hour. I've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so open questions, something, something in the actual code or operation you'd like me to dive more deeply into. Um, and this slide's online at uh, talks.me.org slash automation found references. So there is there is a there is a Drupal.org uh, documentation page about how to install Drupal with Composer. Um, it was wrong for a while. Um, I think it's right now, um, and I think it refers to this. But it's not official, um, in the sense that um, the official way that Drupal is packaged for release is the tarball um, uh, that's downloaded, and um, uh, the Composer installation has mostly been done by by uh, the development team. Um, and so, and it's, it sometimes doesn't work quite right uh, in that there are, there are dependency conflicts if you don't use exactly the right commands um, uh, uh, and you don't install all the right, pack, all, specify whitelist all the right things. And so there is an issue open, um, and it's linked here on my list, of, um, of adding support um, to Composer build uh, to core. It is a prerequisite for uh, making Composer the way Drupal installs itself. Uh, so down the road, it's my full expectation that, that you, when you download Drupal, you'll download some sort of UI. Like if you're not a command line person, you download it and you'll unpack it and you, you, you'll spin up something and it'll, it'll, it'll be a UI on Composer. This also may make uh, like WordPress type automated updates, which not all sites are going to want, but some simple sites are going to want, do want, um, a possible thing. So th there's an issue. Yeah. I don't, I don't need it. I have it for developer experience. So all my automate, almost all my automation, it, is running, I might have a, one or two simple things that I just, that were like a one-liner that didn't, didn't need it, and so I'm doing that in Ahoy, because um, it's a script. Um, but you know, I do it so that when my developers want to run, want to inject a Drush command into the container, rather than typing um, whatever that was, um, you know, Docker, pull the config for the Docker machine uh, string uh, in this container, uh, all that long string of stuff, they can just try, type ahoy drush. And, it, and 
that's my primary reason. My secondary reason is my development team's gotten really used to using Ahoy now. And what they know is when I want to pull down from the server, I do Ahoy rebuild. Then stuff happens. Well, if for some reason Robo stops being maintained, so there's the same reason you have abstraction layers about other things. If Robo stops being maintained or something better comes along and I can swap that out, but my developers can still type Ahoy rebuild and they don't need to learn a new, a new string. So I don't need it, it just makes it a nicer experience. Okay, well, then, since I still have a moment, I'll do a little demo maybe. Okay, so here I am in a robo-managed site. This is what I would do to start up the day. It takes about, I ran it before the talk, it took 47 seconds. Um, it's starting Docker machine. Um, it's, it's initiating NFS between my, uh, my Mac and the Docker sites folder, uh, and it's starting up those two Docker containers uh, that we talked about before. It's not super exciting to watch an empty command line for 47 seconds, but there we go. When this finishes, it's going to offer to launch the project for me. Yes. Spins up Docker Compose. Make sure that my front end tool, my front, my theme is compiled with the latest state. tells me that it's ready to go. I like using iTerm because I can click on some things. Launched in my other window. You need to do std in into the container as well, yeah. and have it interrupt there. Yep, that's what it is. There you go. All right. Um, and that's that, that. So a lot of that's the power of the power of Docker. So I've injected the command, but I've injected it. I'm injecting this command in the container in an interactive mode. So uh, if it gives me, if it does something.
two open issues on, on the Ballast project, one for Linux support, one for Windows support. If you are interested, it's worthwhile. Um, contributions welcome. There was, a, a, there was a BOF at Nashville that I went to. Um, Ted Bowman led it, so if you who knows, you know Ted. Um, and not a lot of action has happened yet, but this is Google. Um, we're all busy. Um, it was about, there's BDEV, there's Doxel, there's um, Lando, there's Ballast, there's um, uh, Docker for Drupal, now there's uh, Open Dev Shop. But a lot of us are working on this problem, and there's so many of us working on this problem that Ted's point was we're probably at critical mass now to come up with the Drupal way, whatever that is. Um, everybody there is building it on Docker. Um, and so I imagine we're going to end up with things that are cool out of all the things that each of us have put together. And eventually, Ted's going to get an issue started and go, he's going to try to get an initiative going for uh, local development process you know, for Drupal that's efficient for support for Drupal. All right. Thank you very much. Woo! All right, our, our final presenter this evening is John Pugh, and he's going to be talking about uh, uh, his dev shop, dev shop local tools uh, while he gets plugged in and set up. Uh, two quick things before uh, I gave you the wrong URL for, for the Drupal Association. It's drupal.org slash association. So if you're going to become a member, go there. And the second thing is like a, a, a public service announcement. Hopefully, um, oh, oh, we need a dongle. Do we have an HDMI dongle in the house? Yeah? All right. Um, so as a, as a quick PSA, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, wow, my, that just fell right out of my head mid-sentence. Oh, so there was a security release today for Drupal 8. All right, Drupal 8.5. What did we already do that? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Monty's telling me that it's okay. Um, we're trying something later, and Monty, Monty has a, he's hatching a plan. Um, but I've already let let the let that little nugget out of the bag. But yeah, there's a there's a security release released for Drupal today. If you're running a Drupal uh, uh, site on Drupal 8, you should definitely take a quick look. Um, it's a, it's a little bit critical. It's not you know it's it's a, it's a, it's really a, an issue with Symphony, which is one of the libraries that Drupal eight de definitely depends on now. Um, but uh, yeah, you should check it out. You should update your Drupal sites, your Drupal eight sites, forthwith. All right, we're gonna change our input and we're gonna see how John's doing. John has been working in the community for two hundred and thirty three years. Yeah. There he is. All right, John Pugh, ladies and gentlemen. Woo! Hi. So a whole lot of Docker today. Wow. Um, kind of weird. Uh, this isn't so much about that, but it does use Docker. So at least it's like, uh, OK, so you heard there's like 150 local development tools or something, right? That's pretty much what we're talking about here. Um, our thing is more of a hosting system. Turns out they're just computers, whether they're in the sky or on your desk. So this is kind of like what you get with the Dev Shop UI. It's all open source. It's free to play. It's pretty pretty drastic when you think of whether Docker is free or free C, um, because it's all it's all right here. You can build it with lots of great code environments. But the most important thing is, uh, you know, you when you when we're talking about it's open source, built on Drupal seven, hosts Drupal seven and eight, built on a mobile project called. Basically, we made a 
simple, super simple way possible that I can get to it. Um, and really, to all it does is run up to my this set here, and I need to try to make it as simple. Um, again, yeah, it still requires Docker dump and boot and whatever. Um, but you can basically just do that. So I'm not going to go through like installation stuff like that because it's getting really, really early. Um, but if you just want to use it, you can just like do that and that will work. Um, <coughs> so real quick, I'm going to try to get this sniffed up working locally. I'm going to try to copy my site down to it.
this however I can edit it do the things I want so I'm gonna go to this step
testing constantly and we're constantly rebuilding and developing better content for them, it actually works. And then the thinner version is what we know is that it works and it's functional and it's been done in many iterations and it's been stable and people have been able to trust it and whatever. And then here's this great piece of code that just pulls whatever it does and makes it work really well.
Can this tool be set up on any of the hosting like DigitalOcean or Acquia to manage on Liquid side? Acquia does the sourcing, so we can. No, I mean, it, I, like, if we are going to migrate to some, some other server, like any like an AWS or DigitalOcean anywhere, right? Any like server, yeah. So if we're looking to run on DigitalOcean anywhere, it's something we can get to those end users and make sure that they understand what we're doing. That's the okay, great question. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to find the alternatives. Yeah, on working with integrating machine learning data? I mean, we just provide the service, so if a customer wants to do that, we can do that for them. We have an open source or like a Linux server. It can have anything we build on it. So if we wanted some other tool to do AI or whatever on there, we can talk to them about that. And then in terms of Slack, does that help in terms of your team management? Um, in terms of what? Managing your team if you're using Slack, where you have Slack? Oh, I thought you might you mentioned Slack. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, the integrations with GitHub are, are outstanding. So GitHub notifies Slack and lets us get pretty quickly the new environments that are created. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's an extra module that lets you know, notify us when there's new ones that are created. But the GitHub integrations seem like it's the most helpful thing for us. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. Catch him later. You can yeah, ask me course. questions later. <laughs>
So it's going to be a, a very fun quiz, uh, I'm sure. I have actually I have with some of the questions. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know how ma many of you know Drupalize Me. It's a actually it's a, a, a platform for a, a video platform with tutorial videos and and other um, materials for learning Drupal. And actually they um, I reached out to them and and they. Uh, offered a price uh, of uh, one free month of, of access to all of the videos. Uh, so actually that's the first price. Whoever wins this is going to have an access to all the videos and all the, the tutorials and Drupalize me for, for a month. question here and the choice on your card. Yeah, the first question is a warm up, so we can have a look here. How did you learn about this meetup? Actual question. All right, here we go. Ah, this is for both. Yeah. Who is our after after party sponsor? Drupal security releases usually come out? Wednesdays is the right answer. Um, a lot of people got it right. And today there was a great session. Anyway, I think it's leading right now. What was the security vulnerability that was fixed today in Drupal 8.5.6? upstream uh, symphony vulnerability in uh, HTTP header for old Microsoft IA Drupal effort. Next question. Jay Redding still leading. Who won the Drupal Association at large director election?
everyone got the right it's susan is right answer right after shahid khan who got right answer j reading still leading j d <laughs> What is the next Drupal event in the state of New York? Ten seconds. That's right. It's decoupled Drupal days. It's happening at John Jay College later this month. Um, just come and check out the website for decoupled Drupal Day Days dot com. JD is on mute now. Next question. Where is DrupalCon North America 2019 going to be held? What does DDEV help you build locally? Five seconds. Nice. Yeah, it helps you build PHP app. Which of these tools is used to manage dependencies? container runtime did all three speakers talk about today? Wednesday of September, September 5th, uh, we'll see you all there. Um, and now we are heading to the after party at Phil's bar. Um, it's on 51st Street. You can go down via the concourse or go to the street and one street over. All right. Thanks for coming.